This week, as I was preparing for the sermon, I, I was thinking about my own kids when they were growing up as well, my two boys. And, and I remember when they were in grade school, they had a day off of school, and I decided to spoil them and take them to the Big Apple Fun Center, to the arcade. Now, the reality is they are each other's best friends, whether they'd ever admit that or not, and they loved spending time together. So I was really just there to be a chauffeur and a piggy bank, um, and they were off playing by themselves most of the time. But I decided to kill some time. I grabbed a few tokens, and I went over to the skeet ball machine and, and really just killing time with it. But the machine I was on malfunctioned, and it spit out way more tickets than it should have. And so as a good Christian, I put in another quarter and played again, right? <laughs> and it happened again. And so by the third or the fourth token, I was like, man, this is really easy. This is kind of crazy. By the fifth or sixth, I was like, this isn't right, and I'm starting to feel guilty. So I did go up, and I told them that the machine was malfunctioning and had them put an out-of-order sign on it. I know what you're all wondering. Yes, I kept the tickets, and I gave them to my boys. <laughs> Don't judge me, right? <laughs> I have to admit, as I was preparing, this week's uh, scripture felt a little too easy as well, maybe even a bit cliché. See, from now through Easter, we're on this new sermon series that, that talks about the ways Jesus acted and interacted in between the destinations. It's all about how we continue to go on the way with Jesus. And this scripture, him walking on water, it, it was almost too easy of a text, too obvious of a story. Honestly, I... I'm usually one of those people who likes to dig into the scriptures we don't pay as much attention to, the scriptures we easily read right over. But this story is one everyone seems to know. It may be so familiar, you, you've maybe even heard sermons on this text before. But God really challenged me and, and pushed me to, to wonder if maybe it has become a text that's so familiar, so common, we stopped digging and stopped learning more about what God has to share with us. See, today's text, it's one of about 20 specific miracles that are listed in the Gospel of Matthew. All four Gospels have uh, miracle stories that are unique just to that one, not shown up anywhere else in the text. Today's scripture is on the other end of that spectrum. Three of the Gospels share this exact same story. So impactful, so meaningful, that all of these writers had to include it in their story as well. But this idea of Jesus walking on water... I'm not sure that's the real miracle. Maybe that's just God being God. But he wasn't the only one that walked on water that day. To give a little context of what's gone on, right before today's story is the feeding of the 5,000. That five loaves and two fishes our kids just learned about this week on Wednesday nights. And if we had read just a little further, when the boat docked at Gesenaret, Jesus was again performing miracles. In verses 35 and 36, it says, People brought all who were sick to him and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. I mean, what an incredible image that people just reaching out and touching his clothes were made whole in this moment. If you look through the Gospels, there, there are multiple places where we just lump together a number of miracle stories in one moment. And it doesn't take away from how important those miracles are. The gospel writers specifically talk about 37 different miracles between the four gospel stories. But in reality, Jesus performed hundreds or, or thousands of miracles. The question is, why were some of them important enough to pull out? Why are some of the stories more important for us to look at? 
You know, there's a, another miracle that the disciples saw that Jesus performed right in the middle of the Sea of Galilee again. It was when he woke up and calmed the storms. In Mark 4, 41, after the wind and the waves subside, it says, The disciples were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know, part of what's fascinating about these two stories is they're two of only three miracles that only the disciples saw. Most miracles were, were very public and the crowds were a part of it. But these miracles, only disciples were there. I often wonder what, what made them different. Why are these stories, why were these miracles just for the disciples? Most biblical scholars will tell you that, that Jesus' miracles can be put into one of three categories. Either it's a story showing that Christ has power over humanity, that Christ has power over nature, or that Christ has power over the supernatural. Another reminder that the God of the universe has control over all that is seen and unseen in our world. But I don't want you to misunderstand. I, I don't think Jesus just did miracles because he was checking it off some divine agenda. Jesus cared. Jesus hurt when other people hurt. And Jesus wanted the very best for people then and now. But as a writer from a literary angle... The stories these, wrote, these writers chose must have been intentional, and I believe were also instructional. So what are the lessons we're supposed to take from this text? Now, Jesus gets done feeding the 5,000, and he tells his disciples to go on before him to the other side of the lake. We call it the Sea of Galilee. As a matter of fact, every single time this body of water is mentioned in the Bible, it calls it a sea. But that might be a little bit of an overstatement. This map gives you a little better perspective. The Sea of Galilee, as we call it, was only about 65 square miles. Not much bigger than Lake McConaughey. At least when McConaughey is full, right? But that seven-mile journey from one side to the other, in the middle of the night with the, the wind battering against them, it had to be such an intimidating journey. Can you imagine being in the water and, and all of a sudden in the corner of your eye you catch something that doesn't quite make sense? And you look over and, and there is someone walking on the water next to the boat it says the disciples were frightened, and I think that is the exact right reaction. We'd be that way as well. And then Jesus tells them not to fear, it's him. And Peter, Peter makes this crazy request. Verse 28, it says, Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out on the water. I can't speak for you. I'm not certain that would have been the way I'd have tested if it was really Jesus, right? I teased Micah this weekend that really what would happen is I'd say, God, if it's really you, have Micah come to you on the water. <laughs> he, he was a lifeguard. He'll be okay. <laughs> but I honestly wonder, why, why didn't the disciples say, Lord, if it's really you, calm the storm, just like we've seen you do before? Not Peter, not, not impulsive Peter. If it's really you, tell me to get out of the boat. Sometimes bravery and crazy come pretty close together. Author and pastor Max Lucado writes, Sometimes storms prompt us to take unprecedented journeys. And I think there's part of us that understands. 
I mean, when life gets crazy, when, when things get hard, sometimes we start to react a little impulsively as well. And people from the outside look at it and say, that doesn't necessarily make sense. It's like, it's like if you have a coworker that, that you've really tried to win over and it seems nothing you do matters. And this little voice in your head says, maybe I should stop trying. Or the teenager who, who loses the big game and decides they're done with that sport and they're never going to play again. Maybe it's the, the salesperson who lost a big contract and decides to switch careers. For, for us, maybe it is this this thing that pushes us over, and, and it's God's way of saying you either need to try harder or you need to change directions. But those from the outside, they look at it, and, and it seems to be a little impulsive and over the top. For most of us, looking from the outside, stepping out of the boat seems a little crazy. And that's where Peter starts. then it happens. The miracle comes. In verse 29, Jesus says, come, and, and Peter steps out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. I don't know about you, but I've got questions, right? I, I want to know more about this story. Like, how many steps did he take before he sank, Right? We want to know what were the other disciples doing? Who was saying what? Or maybe those words weren't Bible appropriate, and that's why we don't have them. I don't know. I, I, I got to know, like, did the waves break around his feet, or did he go up and down on the waves? Did he step on a fish somewhere along the way? What was this experience like? But the writers don't tell us. What they do tell us is, is that when he takes his eyes off of Jesus, the miracle ends. Again, I love the way Max Lucado writes it. He says, whether or not storms come, we cannot choose. But where we stare during the storm, that we can choose. I think there's this part of us that knows it, but... But we don't always follow it. The reality is, some of us are going through some big storms in our life right now. It seems almost every week we hear about someone else who's starting a cancer journey. Every month I add a few more names to my prayer list of people who lost a loved one. Maybe it's, it's different. Maybe it's a depression that keeps hitting you and you just can't seem to kick it. Maybe it's an addiction that, that you've tried to hide that you just can't kick. Whatever the storms of life are, sometimes in the midst of the storm it feels so overwhelming. And the reality is there are, are storms that hit us that are too big to face alone. But thanks be to God, we, we are never alone. Even when life's storms rage, the God of the universe is there. Still calling us to come to him. But I also want to caution you that that sometimes we get in this habit of, of looking at scriptures and looking at these miracle stories and thinking of them as nothing more than a metaphor. The thing is, we simply view these stories as, as kind of a parable instead of as historical. We start to cheat God out of his glory. Let me give you an example from when I was in college. I, I was... Just coming back to my faith, even though I was raised in the church, I, I fell away for a while. But in college, I really connected again with campus ministry and started getting involved in the local church. 
But there was this guy I'd been in a Bible study with, and every time he had just a little different answer than anyone else in the room, and I, I was just intrigued by it. And so I asked him how he came to these conclusions, and he says, I always approach the Bible from rationalistic view. At the core of his belief, he said that maybe miracles weren't supernatural. He says maybe they're just misunderstandings of something rational. He said, if you took someone from the depths of the Amazon and put them in front of your TV, they'd think it was magic. We call it a pastime. They see a miracle. He kept going and he says, so from a rationalistic approach, maybe antibiotics are what, cle- he- what healed those illnesses, or CPR is what brought people back to life. And the more he talked, the more uncomfortable I got. (laughs) See, I was 20 or 21, and I I didn't know how to respond. He was this college professor. Certainly he knew better, but it never sat right with me. I didn't, didn't respond at all. But I wish I had. I wish I'd have known enough then to say, oh, but you're, you're missing the glory of God. You're going to look at this and say that, that maybe it was medicine that healed a disease. But in Matthew 12, when the man with the withered hand stretched it out for all to see, I don't know how modern medicine answers that one. You might look at the story of Jesus calming the storm and say it was just divine timing. Storms stop all the time. But Jesus walking on water, that that defies all logic. You look at the story of of the little girl who who was raised from the dead just moments after she died, and, and maybe you look at that and say that could be CPR. But when Lazarus walked out of the tomb days later, That is different. The lame walked. The blind could see. The lepers were healed. The rationalist might say it's a coincidence, and and you can answer that once or twice. But hundreds, thousands of times, Jesus was more than that. I don't believe the crowds followed Jesus just because he was a good moral teacher or because sometime down the road people got better. And I don't believe the disciples gave their life for a metaphor. They worshiped a Messiah, a miracle worker. See, if we reduce miracles to nothing more than metaphors, then we never step out in faith. God can't heal us and God can't help us if if we've just decided it's nothing more than a story. And I agree, I have never seen anyone walk on water. And I've never been brave enough to step out of the boat. You know, for years I, I looked at the story and I, I think I misunderstood it. In verse 30, it says, But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus reaches out and, and lifts him up and puts him into the boat and says, Why did you doubt? For years I read this story and I, and I thought that must be the takeaway, just don't doubt. And so I tell myself over and over again, Mike, just don't doubt. Mike, just don't doubt. And sometimes I'd had doubts. I started to wonder if I'd failed. Do you know what I missed? Before he failed... 
Peter walked on water. Maybe only a few steps, but oh, oh, in that moment, he experienced a miracle. That is the God we serve. Maybe it's not a reminder that we doubt, (laughs) but a reminder that at moments we can believe. (laughs) At moments we can see the miracles of God. Don't get me wrong, I'm not expecting any of us to walk on water this afternoon. But maybe there are places God still calls us to step out. And I don't think that means this story is a metaphor. (laughs) I think it means the miracles we experience might be different. But the miracle worker, he is still the same. Church, what's what's a task that, that has always seemed too hard or too big for you to accomplish? What's a challenge God put on your heart that scares you to death? (laughs) What seems impossible except for God? Because that might be exactly where God is calling you to next. Who knows? (laughs) Maybe in the midst of it all, you get to experience a miracle. Or maybe you get to become a miracle for someone else. I think the key of it all is that that when we trust, when we believe, when we act, when we stay focused on Christ, we can be amazed too. What does the God of the universe have in store for us? So much more than we expect. If we stay focused on Christ. Amen? Would you pray with me today? Holy, loving, and gracious God, we are so thankful. So thankful for the stories in the Bible that are are so much more than stories. We are so thankful that your Son came to dwell among us and to give his life for us. God, help us to see those places in our lives where where we feel scared, where we are intimidated to step out in faith. Then help us to hear your voice saying, come. Thank you, God, that you are still a miracle worker that you are still calling us to step out in faith and be brave in this world. Help us to find the places we can serve you better so that the whole world may know your amazing love. In your name we ask it. Amen.